Excellent. Well, I'm so happy to be here today to present this webinar, Centering Practices for Pediatric Providers. This is with Dovetail Learning, and we're gonna be talking about the We Are Resilient approach. And I'm thrilled to have Dr. Grace Martin here with me today. And I'll let her introduce herself in just a moment. Um, but first, before we do anything, we really just wanna appreciate you. Appreciate you for showing up, Thank you for being you, for handling all the challenges that come up. Grace is going to share a lot of the challenges today that pediatric providers have, and I'm sure you have many of the same. And we know you spend so much of your heart and your time and your energy taking care of the people around you, both professionally and personally, and we know that you care a lot. So thank you for doing that. It means all the world to us and to the world. A little bit about myself. Um, I have two adult children. My daughter is recently engaged, so we're going to be a family of five. And um, I also care for my mother who has Alzheimer's and I love kitties. We have some. And just early in my career, I was project director for Bright Futures, as I'm sure most of you are aware. It was trained, um, most of you have been trained in it, guidelines for health supervision for infants, children, and adolescents. And I see the work that we're doing now in We Are Resilient really as a continuation of Bright Futures. Bright Futures started, you know, a, a movement in health supervision about how we have to look at children in a wider context. And the work we're doing in We Are Resilient really talks about the trauma that people are undergoing and how can we help them. So so, and now Grace, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Grace Martin, and um, I am a pediatric hospitalist, private practitioner, and I work in the after hours clinic um, all here in Northern California. I have been practicing pediatrics and taking care of children since 1997. So that would be 25 years. And I've I've loved it. It's been a journey and it's, it's crazy because my husband asked me how it was, how was it, how is it being halfway through your career? <laughs> and, and I thought, I just started. It feels like every day is a new um, challenge, a new story. Um, I, I love it. Um, when I re retire, I will still practice pediatrics in some way, shape or form, either teaching or um going abroad and helping in communities that um, require medical care. Um, I have my husband you see in that photo on the left. He's in the back there. We met in medical school. Um, he's, I think he was born with resilience. So it's good sharing it with him. He's given me some good insight too from his perspective of life. My son there is 14. He's a freshman in high school. And my daughter taking the selfie of the family. She is a, a second year in college now. Um, and that is my little dog, Cal. And go Bears, I went to Cal, so his name is Cal. Um, so that's us. Um, I, I, when my daughter went off to college last year, I decided I would get back into the AAP and find something that um, um, I was passionate about. And I'm very passionate about teaching and legislation. And I happened to come across an AP um, email that said AP resilience, join the circle. And I opened it up and the rest is history. And here I am because I learned so much from it. And I use, I would have to say everything I use, I use pretty much every day. And I think it has, I think it has made me a better mom, um, a wife and a better pediatrician. So I would just like to share um, what I've learned and how I've learned it, and maybe have some of you join us in the Resilience family. Excellent. Thank you so much, Grace. I feel the same way. That's why I'm passionate about teaching. It's made me a better person, a better professional, a better wife, a better mother. This cut work can really continue to transform us over our lifetime. So at Dovetail Learning, our mission is to strengthen the resilience of adults, youth, and children. And our vision is a world of kind, connected human beings. We feel like with those tools, we can, we can create the solutions that we all need for the world that we want. And um, a quick overview of the We Are Resilient approach. We have, it's a, it's a approach with a lot of things and we're just looking at one part of it today. But as we look at the whole approach, we have our cultural patterns. That's how we view the world. They give us cultural resilience. 
Then we have our protective patterns. That's how we react to the world. And they give us reactive resilience. Then we have our centering skills. That's what we're really focusing on today. Our connecting skills and our collaborating skills. And all of those are how we create the world we want. All of these you can learn more about in, in our many books, also in our trainings, and as Grace said, in our resilience circles, which are the way that people get a chance to reflect on and really learn more about the work. And I think it was a really powerful experience for many people, including Grace. We have curiosity, choice, and courage, and those are our resilient mindsets. And that's just to give you a quick overview of all the different parts. As I said, today, we're just focusing on the centering skills, because that's really all we can cover in a half an hour, and just a few of those. So I'll let Grace talk a little more about the challenges of pediatric provider space. Yeah, so I feel like, you know, with the different, um, in terms of uh, our audience today and those who will be watching um, this recorded webinar in the future, no matter what you do in caring for um, children, there will be so many different challenges that you will come across, um, not only just in, in your work environment, the work stress, the time constraints, the number of children you need to see um, in, in what, five minutes for a 15 minute appointment, the financial burdens and the the time constraints. Uh, you may be, you may have loans, you may have um, debt to pay, you may have a family to, to feed. And so all those things are weighing on your mind and you're constantly thinking about those things as you're caring for um, children um, and caring for your own family. And I think the biggest thing that is really tough that we always have to get back to is our work-life balance. I think it's kind of like a scale when one there's too much work, you know, it's, it's not good for life. And there's you know, too much family, not enough, you know, focusing on what you want to do for your career, you just get off kilter. So having a good um, work-life balance, I think is really important. And it's good to focus on yourself because um, when you focus on yourself, it's just like being on a plane. When the flight attendant says, put your mask on first before you put your child's mask on, this is um, a, this is a lot like that because we can't care for others if we're not caring for ourselves first and foremost, and we are much better providers when we do care for ourselves. And just a reminder, we're always going to have those storm. We're always going to have the things Grace was, Grace was sharing me today that she thinks this winter is going to have a lot of things that providers are dealing with. Just there seems to be a lot on the plate, and there's always also the miracle. There's always also the great things that we have in our life. And part of resilience is being able to hold both of those at the same time, understanding the challenges happen and they will always continue to happen. And we have access to so many things that can help us focus on the miracle and draw strength from that. So that's really a quick overview of what we're doing and what we're trying to do. So before we go any further, let's dive into this word resilience. It's a little bit of a tricky word. Most people don't go around going, oh, I want more resilience. And yet it encompasses so much of what makes us thrive. And that's why we use the word resilience and we focus on it. And I think the big thing is that we face challenges daily. And just knowing that resilience is the ability to adapt and respond to meet those challenges effectively. Also understanding our resilience will be higher or lower in different situations. So we can be going along and a certain, we have an encounter with a certain patient or family and suddenly, oh, we feel so stressed. What are we gonna do? And then we recover our center again, or conversely, we can be like really stressed, something happens. And then we, we have a great conversation with someone, we feel really connected and our resilience is stronger. So it just goes like this. And no matter what we do, we're never going to completely eliminate some of that. But the other thing we really want to focus on with specific skills and focus and attention, our resilience can be strengthened. And a lot of what we're talking about today is not necessarily stuff you've never heard of. A lot of it you probably have heard of and maybe you have done and practiced regularly. Our focus is helping you be more intentional about that because being more intentional about it really does help you. I know Grace has something to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I... And I like the intentionality of it um, because I think when we come prepared, um, not just physically, but um, mentally, 
uh, then things that come, you know, the challenges that come our way are not as difficult. And we practice what we learn um, with how to deal with these different challenges. It becomes easier and easier and easier. But we need to prepare for that, just like we prepare for um, in school, in college, um, even preparing for like today um, to, to talk with all of you. When we prepare, we're better, we're better equipped to handle the challenges ahead. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There are many different ways, but we're gonna focus in on, on uh, two or three of them today. So just also to give you another um, focus on what we're doing here, how do we teach the Re We Are Resilient approach? Because a lot of you will go, oh, this is great. I wanna share it with my patients and families, which is fabulous. But the most important thing we emphasize is that we have to practice it ourselves first to become better. Right. And then, and also that micro practices are key. If we practice in little doses, and we'll talk about that, then we can really practice. And after we practice, then we model and others can learn from us. And then we're able to coach using curiosity, compassionate questions, and encouragement. And then we're able to be the provider that we want for the people that we work with and the people we work for because we practice it ourselves. So that internal practice is really important. So what can get in the way of resilience? I'm just gonna do a quick overview of this. Again, we've covered this a lot more in depth in our, in our um, other trainings and in our reference books. But the most important thing is to realize we can be going along, everything can be great. You know, we have great interactions with a certain patients and our day can be just humming and we walk in and then a stress event happens. Something happens and we have this reaction. We call it protective patterns. Oh, and we can just, oh, reach a peak. It could be anger, it could be sadness. It could just feel frustrated. We reach a peak and then it can take a while to calm down. We can feel depleted. We call that losing our cool. And I'm sure we've all felt that things happen to us and we just feel losing our cool. And the thing about it, we understand also that in order to keep our cool, a lot of this involves noticing what's happening. Oh, that, I heard this from someone and that really started me off. Wonder in a sense, is, what, is my reaction helpful? <laughs> is it helpful to get myself all in a twit about whatever it is? And maybe I'll choose a resilient skill instead. And then I can calm down and feel centered. Doesn't take away all of the curve, it just flattens it. We're not so much in the red zone. We stay a little bit more in the green zone. We have a little bit, maybe a little yellow, but not so much. And then also that it's not always right to choose a resilient skill. Sometimes the what we've chosen as our protective patterns is helpful. So again, this is just to acknowledge that that stress curve, what we're trying to do is bring it down get it more into the green zone and not have it so much in the red zone. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Anything you wanna add, Grace? Yeah, I think um, the, the, if you look at the last slide, it's hot and angry and just explosive. <laughs> it's, um, and just looking at it with all the colors and, and just having a stressful thing happen and just comes to a peak and then a reaction and then the, the downslope is um, not always very smooth. And I like the next slide because when you when you practice the um, different skills that you learn throughout this resilience course, and we'll talk about some of them today, it just makes that peak and that, that just difficult challenge, the seemingly difficult, um, seem a lot, a lot easier and easier to tackle. And, and the more you do that and the more you use those skills and the more you see the skills work where you're calming down and now you're centered again, you get more confidence that when I use these skills, I am I can do it. I It's fine. Challenges happen. It's part of the journey. And we're just going to keep that's life. It's, it's full of challenges, good and bad challenges. But every time I tackle it um, with, my, with my skills, um, I'll, I'll be fine because I was fine before. And so that's what I like about it because with life, when we get better when we're challenged. So um, I used to, just, oh gosh, just more and more. What challenge do I have next? And then I, you know, thinking about it and maturing and, and going through my career and then, you know, hitting this resilience course and realizing like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Actually, challenge is not bad because it makes me, it has made me 
who I am. And without these challenges, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be able to tackle these difficulties and, and, you know, run into a code, you know, or run into an upset parent and be able to deal with it and li really listen and hear what's happening and then contribute. So um, if there were no challenges and life was easy all the time, when something big comes up, it's going to be really tough to deal with it. So I think challenges are actually, I, I welcome them. Um, but even more so now that I have a different approach to how to handle them. Well, beautifully said. That's right. We're wiser people. We can offer the world more because we've been through things and we have the skills to do it. So as we said, we're going to be talking about these centering practices for pediatric providers all under the umbrella of the We Are Resilient approach. And uh, our first set of practices, what's the ones we're focusing on today are our centering practices. They give us personal resilience and they help us create our world. Grace? Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of different um, ways we can center ourselves. Um, and they are basically paying attention and um, being curious about, okay, I wanna center myself. I need to get back to where I am instead of being all over the place. Um, and when we center ourselves and use these skills, um, it reduces stress, drops your cortisol level, improves your, your well-being. So you feel like, okay, all right, I'm feeling much better. I'm back to myself. We can communicate with parents better. We can be better parents ourselves. Um, and it's easier to connect and work with other people when we are centered versus flustered and anxious and angry. Um, so being centered just for life is, is powerful um, in the workforce um, as well as at home. And there are different ways we can center ourselves. So you can see the list there, noticing myself and just when you're faced with an issue, let's just say, you know, you come across, um, uh, um, you walk into a room, you know, you have three rooms that are full and you're, you're running five minutes behind and you walk into a room. Notice if you just notice, like, I'm really harried. Okay, wait, I need to just calm down so I can just tackle, get through these 20 patients and you just, you know. Notice how you're feeling. What are your emotions? Are you upset? Are you angry? Just noticing how you feel and the plethora of emotions that we can have um, is really helpful. Um, breathing mindfully and slowing things down and bringing in some vagal tone versus, you know, breathing quickly and being worried and being stressed out. When we breathe mindfully, we center ourselves so we can just focus on right here, right now. We can start with just taking some deep, deep breaths and being in the moment, um, letting go. Sometimes we walk into a challenge and we have this thing on our back, this thing that upsets us. Maybe, you know, Maybe your, your parent said something to you that really upset you. Um, maybe um, you got into an argument with you know, your partner. Sometimes just letting go frees up space and frees up um, your mind to be centered, to feel like you can tackle what's in front of you versus carrying along this you know, big, heavy load. Finding gratitude, um, that's huge for me. We'll talk more about that. Um, finding that where you are, despite what's going on, that you are thankful for the little tiniest things can help you move ahead in your day and find positivity. Um, positive reframing, um, that is super helpful because like for instance, if someone you're driving out, you're going to work and someone cuts you off and initially, because you're such in such a hurry, you might think, and say something you might regret or think something you probably would normally think. And um, if you just say, oh, maybe they have an emergency. Maybe they're on their way. Maybe there's a sick loved one that they're going to visit. And my big thing is maybe they're having a baby. Maybe they need yeah. to get there. They really need to get in front of me. And I really should just be understanding. So that's usually my thing, unless, you know, there doesn't appear to be someone who's pregnant about to have a baby in the car, then I just reframe it a little differently. And it's funny because my kids are starting to do that now too. And nurturing myself, taking care of that 
that spirit and that soul in this in the body. Um, that's very important. But we're going to focus today. We're going to see if we can get through breathing mindfully, finding gratitude, and nurturing myself. Um, and maybe in the future. Say, we can talk about that too. Grace, um, in terms of positive reframing, you did a perfect job of that when you were talking about the challenges that come our way, right? We can we can just feel overburdened by them, or we can say, look, they're making us stronger, they're making us, you know, better adaptable, they're making us wiser, right? It was just a great example of positive reframing. So just wanted to name that because it's helpful when we're noticing, oh, that's what you're doing. So wanted to say right. that. Right. Right. Thank you. So breathing mindfully is, um, when I was growing up, I'd always hear someone when I'm getting up to bat for a game or a softball game, when I'm going to give a speech to, for, you know, during a student council meeting and, and throughout life, everyone would always tell me, just take a deep breath. I mean, take a deep breath, take a deep breath. I'm like, I can take a deep breath. I've just I've got so much to do when I can't, I can't, I can't. Right. And so as I started to, um, go into college and then the med school. And, and I would start to find like, when I just take a deep breath before I walk into a situation, oh, that's weird. I just, I'm calmer. And um, just over the last few years, especially during the pandemic, when there was so much stress um, and everything, all the information was coming in us left and right. It's, it's just really helpful to just center yourself. And I think when we're, we come to a challenge, the initial thing is your adrenal gland on your kidneys just go boop and they spurt out these catecholamines. So now your eyes are wide open and your blood pressure is really high or it's increasing. Your heart races because your body's feeling, I have a challenge. I need to be fully prepared and cortisol is secreted. Um, sometimes if there's just some of us, like I'm a person who I can just secrete it like that and it goes my level of cortisol goes high and it can stay for hours. And if I don't do something to kind of just bring it down, it's helpful in certain situations. Like if I'm being chased by a bear or if, you know, I, you know, I see a kid crossing the street and you run out and grab the kid from the street crossing where there's a car coming. That's actually happened before. They can be helpful, but sometimes you don't need that much stress. And so bringing the level of cortisol down um, is helpful and a, and a good way to do that is just deep breathing. So when you breathe in and then you blow out, you're stimulating the vagal nerve and that brings, you know, calms your heart rate and brings everything down. I love this photo. I think, so I, um, I just wanted to tell you a story that I wanted to see if you could do a very quick um, breathing mindfully practice. Um, I had, uh, last year I had a 16 year old patient, um, who was admitted to, um, our hospital, um, the 16 year old, it was, um, there were fires in the area that he lived in, um, and COVID was everywhere. He had a relative that was sick with COVID and was in the hospital. Um, he was very stressed and anxious and panicked. Um, he did have a history of asthma in the past. Uh, and he'd gone from emergency room to urgent care to emergency room to urgent care and back and then ended up in our emergency room where they were concerned that he was breathing about 40 times a minute. As a 16 year old, that's more than double the amount of times you should be breathing in a minute. His heart rate was 140. It was close to like a newborn baby and his blood pressure was 140 to 150. It was, it was really high. And um, he was getting these medications to help him breathe better. Um, they had, they weren't helping. So they called and uh, I saw him, I brought him upstairs and I just, his lungs were crystal clear, yet he was still breathing difficult. He has had breathing difficulty and was working hard to breathe. And so I recognized that he was probably having a, an anxiety attack or a panic attack. And our minds are so powerful and I think his mind had just taken over and he was very, you know, anxious with everything happening, understandably. And so, um, because his lungs were clear and his oxygen was 100%, I decided to try um, mindful breathing with him. And so um, I asked the nurses to, he was hooked up to the monitors. Um, we could see his blood pressure, heart rate, uh, oxygen, respiratory rate. We um, closed the shades 
just light dim dim lighting. Um, I had everyone just close their eyes and um, I rested my hand on the patient's hand so that he wouldn't know that he wasn't alone. And um, I played some ocean music like this photo in front of you. And it was nice and calming. And we practiced deep breathing together and we did it for five minutes. I continued slowly to wane you know, down with the breathing um, patterns um, down to 10 minutes. And after three to four minutes, you could see on the monitors, his heart rate dropping, 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 dropping from uh, 140, 130, 120, 110, 100, 90. His blood pressure started dropping from 150 to 140, 130, down to about 117. And his respiratory rate and his work of breathing dropped down to normal. His oxygen obviously had stayed 100% the whole time. And when we were done breathing, he opened his eyes. I turned around and I saw all the nurses like this. <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> they were like, what? Wow. And I always knew that I always knew that when I did that myself, I felt like that was what was happening to me, but I hadn't really done it in a hospital setting where we had exhausted all things medical, all, you know, Western medicine. And well, this is Western and Eastern, but um, that was a powerful, powerful experience to have with that patient. And he said he felt so happy and he couldn't believe he was, it's gone. <laughs> he couldn't believe that just, he was able to control with breathing and just focusing on where he was in the moment that that helped him feel better. And it lasted for three and a half hours. And then when he started to feel anxious again, we came back and we did it again and then it helped bring everything down again. And so um, he said he would take the practice with him and I hope it's continued to help him. So, if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute to just do yeah. some deep breathing with me. I think wherever you're at, if you just close your eyes and close your eyes and think of a place that's that you love that's beautiful or calming. Now just put yourself in that place, block everything out. If thoughts come through, it's okay see them and then whisk them away, swipe it left, let it go away or swipe it right. Just take a deep breath slowly in through your nose, through your nostrils, into your posterior pharynx, through your trachea and bronchi and into your alveoli and slowly let it out. Blow out that carbon dioxide let it go through the branches of your bronchi and your trachea and out through your posterior pharynx and through your nose. You can also take your breath in, follow that track through your nostrils, your posterior pharynx, your trachea, bronchi, alveoli, get that oxygen in there and blow it out. Let it go through your bronchioles, bronchi, trachea, and you can blow it out through your mouth. And one more time, in through your nostrils, feel the air, the gas going in into your lungs and slowly let it out. And breathe through your mouth. That's something that um, I do every day um, before when I wake up, I'm just thankful that a, I woke up and that I got rest and that I'm able to start the day before even getting out of bed. I will do some deep breaths. And if I know I have a busy schedule, I'll do exactly that three deep breaths, sometimes just counting one, two, three, four, hold two, three, four, and breathe out two, three, four. 
gives a nice little pattern. And when I, my mind is too cluttered and it's hard to focus, I do, I count when I'm taking my breath and it really helps set the tone for my day. Um, I think that there was a, a nice graph that shows when we wake up in the morning, our cortisol is high. That is just how we are as human beings. Um, we're ready for the day. Your alarm might beep, bop, 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 bop. You might have texts or maybe a phone call will look you up. Or some people still have pagers. We have pagers at the hospital. A pager might wake you. Um, so with your cortisol so high, it's really hard to just calm. So taking those breaths really drives that the vagal system um, and calms you down. So you get the parasympathetic response in. Um, so I really love this because I'm like very sciencey. So just seeing this photo really helps explain how that does help. I have to say, I feel so much calmer just from that little breathing. Thank you for taking us through it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, so it takes about 28 days 30 days to develop a habit. And when I found that, boy, that really helped, and that was during the pandemic with the um, patient I took care of, I really made it a practice and tried to make sure that I was every day doing even a few deep breaths in the morning. And when you do it, and that's just, that can take 30 seconds. And when you do that, you, you sh you're starting a practice. It's like baby steps small little things. We have so much going on. And as providers who care for children, there's constantly learning and reading and caring and note taking and billing. And there's just so much, but just take taking a little bit of time out of your day might help, you know, get you started off on the right foot. Um, and when I hit a stoplight, I, I see that and we hit, I hit a stoplight or when I get home, I just take some deep breaths um, before you run into a very angry parent or parenting your own children where you know this is going to be challenging. Taking a few deep breaths before you start talking will help you put you in a better mind frame. So I challenge you to try the, this micro practice of when you wake up, take a few deep breaths Put yourself in the, like picture yourself in a quiet place or a calming place, or just have your eyes shut when you wake up in your in your room, and then um, before you sleep, because yeah. that just brings your heart rate down, and that's very yeah. and you can I use it yeah that with other things too. Yeah, I find I use it particularly before I go to sleep because it's just like oh, makes a huge difference. And if I wake up in the middle of the night, there's too much going. I'm like, just do your mindful breathing. Breathing mindfully makes a huge difference at that point. I agree. And so um, finding gratitude is another skill that helps center us. That's really worked for me. Um, I think with your there were some studies done. There's actually um, The Happiness Advantage written by Sean Acor. I don't know if you read that book, but um, it's a powerful book if you get a chance to read that. And he's um, a PhD in psychology at Harvard. And he talks about how he observes people. Um, I'm going to cut it super short. But even people who, are, who see themselves as pessimists people who see themselves not as pessimists and not as optimists, when they have daily, when they practice daily gratitude, you see a shift from the people who consider themselves pessimistic to being gra gracious. And um, it's very interesting. And it just starts with a, just a tiny little practice. So, you know, being curious about, you know, what am I, what am I grateful for right in this moment? With so many things going on in our lives as you know, parents, providers, um, partners, your head could be so cluttered, but if we just practice, like when I wake up or in the middle of my day before I have my lunch or in the evening as I lay in my bed, what am I grateful for? What one thing am I grateful for? And then work your way up to two and to three 
And currently I'm at three when I wake up and then three when I go to bed and I try to make it three different things. That's the challenge. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge, but if you really think about your day and the interactions and the wins and the challenges where you're able to just center yourself and make a difference, not only in your life, but someone else's life, then um, it's very rewarding. So rewarding. I totally agree. For me, I find like, even like if I'm in the middle of an argument with my husband, if I pause and think about what I'm grateful for, for him, and it just helps me take that pause and I can pull that argument down. I can like, oh, okay. And I can speak more calmly and have a, a much better conversation. It's just amazing how powerful gratitude can be in all aspects of our life. Yeah. And if, even with um, productivity, there were studies that were, were done where um, people in the banking industry, um, they started their day with gratitude. They just said three things in every day when they started work, three things that they were grateful for at the end of the 30 days, the productivity markedly increased. So it's, it's, I think it's, there's so much to be gained by trying to find gratitude, even in the littlest things like, thank you for the sun. Thank you for the rain. Thank you that I'm healthy today. Exactly. Because um, we're not always healthy. So it absolutely improves sleep because you're just releasing natural endorphins in your brain and it helps you sleep and relax dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, you know, all the valuable neurochemicals that can calm us and relax us and help us sleep and feel better. And with practice, if you just say, hey, I have 28 days, if you go to your, to your phone and you say, what three things am I grateful for? 6 a.m., whatever the time is, whenever you, you know, get up and you, and you practice that and you make it for 30 days, you'll see how, how do you feel at the end of those 30 days? So I challenge you. So start with one thing in the morning and maybe one thing in the evening and then work your way to six things and you will find them. They're there. They're I, all. I love that suggestion. You can just put, ask, you know, Hey Siri, remind me to be great, grateful every morning at 7.30 or whatever time it is. And, and Siri will remind you <laughs> and you can, you can add that to your life. Like you said, it's a great micro practice. <laughs> and then finally, um, nurturing myself. So I, this sounds really crude, but I mean, we're all just be, we're temples. We're all beings. And inside of us sort of resides our, our spirit, our soul, who we really are. When you close your eyes, you don't see your physical body, that the thoughts, you, that's you. And so when we take care of our, our, our temple that houses our spirits, we can be better people, better partners, better parents, better friends, providers. So I think it's one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves. So um, I think all we do we, as providers for children or adults, just as providers, period, I think we're always looking to take care of everybody else. And then we put ourselves last. And when we do that, over time, we get burnt out. And we really need to just focus. And it doesn't take much time just to say, wake up in the morning or find a time during the day where you can take a minute and just say, how am I feeling? Um, what have I done for myself today to take care of myself? Um, am I being compassionate with myself? Because we always practice compassion with others, with the, like the children we care for, the family members we take care for. But are we taking care of ourselves so we can love ourselves and also be able to give more compassion to those we care for? Um, I think for me, for me, the thing, the two things that um, I think about in this way is that like we wouldn't, the tools that you use as a pediatric provider, you wouldn't let them degrade. I mean, you wouldn't bring like a broken stethoscope into the room. You wouldn't have another tool that you use that you didn't have any maintenance for. And yet somehow we expect our, 
ourselves to not have the maintenance. We'd expect to, to, to do all the work we do. We are the instrumentals of our work. And if we don't take care of ourselves, we cannot be the people that we need to do and do the work that we need to in the world. And for some reason, that message is not being taught. I mean, it's not for a lot yeah. of us, but, um, and I, I think that's a critical part of it. And also just as human beings, we are high maintenance. For some reason, we're able to think of ourselves, oh, I don't need any sleep or food. It's like, no, we need time every day to maintain this body and then maintain this mind and emotions and our spirit. And we need to give ourselves that time so we can do the work we need to in the world. That's a perfect analogy, Mary. I love that analogy. I think that, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, we take care of everyone else and we take care of ourselves and um, the temple, our body, we need to make sure that you would never just let your computer run and never turn it off because it's going to glitch. And that's like us. So, you know, getting good sleep, turning off the computer or rebooting it, um, putting in good energy. We, it's either solar powered or it's through electricity. We just need to get that good energy in so that we function well. Um, and then stimulating our minds. If we just do one thing all the time, just work, 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 work. We don't take time to um, maybe read a book or go to a play or go out for a walk, play pickleball, whatever makes you happy. You've got to do something like that for yourself every week. And, and you really have to, we, it would be good to schedule it. I would always say I would do that, but it wasn't until I actually penned in, in, in green, green is hope, <laughs> penned in, in green in my calendar that what I was going to do um, if I was going to meet a friend. So something like a social connection or, or, or going to, you know, church or going to um, a reading group, a book club, something, something for the social connectivity. Um, and I think it's, yeah, oh yeah, no, I think if we, if we do that, then we feel better we're better providers. And I think the, a really big thing that we always talk about with our patients is get, get out there, get exercise, get sun, eat well. Um, we need to do that ourselves. So we need to model that kind of behavior because when they look at us, they need to see, we, we are people who, who move. We are people who put good fuel into our body. We rest. I know the resting part is a really hard thing because especially for hospitalists who work 24 hours or residents who are busy, 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 one rotation to the next, just try your, try your best to get good sleep. And if you can at least improve the quality of your sleep with some gratitude practice and some mindfulness that could make, help make the quality of your sleep, even if it's less, a little bit better. Um, and um, I think that Using these skills, I think I'll be able to practice better. I think for me, for me, I really, um, for residents who will end up um, watching this, um, I think these will go a long way for you. And um, practicing the skills, so when you're in attending and you're out practicing, that's it's going to be very helpful for you to approach every challenge that you're going to see um, down the line. Um, but I think all these skills for all of us as providers and people who take care of children, um, these are very valuable. They're just the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much, so much more, but hopefully these have really helped you today. Um, some skills that you could practice and just do tiny little baby steps and try to incorporate, incorporate them into your lives and into your, um, into work. And, um, I love Brene Brown. Uh, we are hardwired for connection. Yeah. And every day when we have, we're dealing with each other. So we want to bring forth our best us, the best me. So when I'm connected with others, because we're social people, um, we basically want to come and uh, be vulnerable and share and listen. And when we do all that, it's easier to do all that when we're centered. Um, that's a great way to describe how a lot of healing happens, you know, in your, your beautiful story about the, the boy who was healed through breathing mindfully. I mean, sometimes we get so caught up in like prescribing and what are the tests and that we forget that being with each other, being present is a huge part of healing and a huge part of the work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, 
for coming in today, Grace. It was just a delight to be with you. Mm -hmm. I want to tell everyone that we have a lot of free di digital resources on our website. You can join a circle, a training. We'll have we have lots of free webinars. You can join our newsletter. Um, and there's a lot of there's also our anticipatory guidance books that you can purchase that has all the science, all the skills, has everything. It's easier to understand, I will say, if you've had a training, but you can certainly get it um, either buy it or download it free. And we have other books and posters available. We have activities for families. So um, just thank you for being here and um, plenty of ways to find out more information. We obviously you can you can email info at dovetail learning. You can also email me directly if you want to get in touch with. Grace, just email me and I'll forward it to Grace. And um, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you on more webinars. Thank you. Thank you.